All right, my dudes, how's it going? So today I am going to be re-recording the ball bounce tail animation because we are using a different method this year than we did last year. All right, so the very first thing I'm going to do is create a new composition. You can uh, set that to HDTV 108025. All right, and I'll make my duration about 10 seconds long. Okay and we can then say okay cool so here's my workspace the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a body for my character all right so we'll create an ellipse and we don't want this to be too large all right so i'm going to make a fairly small ball and this is simply because we still need to add our tail to this piece okay now the anchor point we are going to grab our pan behind tool shortcut for those y and we're going to lock it to our lower left corner all right that's so that when we adjust our scale it is scaling towards that point as though our character is pulling in on a let's say a foot that's been planted on the ground as opposed to pulling in on its center okay so what we need to do now is we're going to create our position okay so i'm going to hit Control or command r to bring up my rulers i'll create a floor and i'll just give myself an idea of some space so that I know where my tail is kind of going to be sitting. All right, I can then lock those guides by going up to view and lock guides. Okay, so I'm gonna start with my ball down here and I'll hit the stopwatch to create my first position keyframe. Okay, so I'm just gonna work on top of these seconds so that you guys can sort of follow along a little bit easier. Obviously at the end, we would then readjust the position of our keyframes to make our actions slightly faster. All right, so very first position has been made and my second position, I'm going to drag my ball backwards, All right? Our character is going to be shifting back, stretching up as it goes, building up the anticipation for that jump, squashing down and then springing forward, all right? So the first thing that I'm going to do, let me adjust this color here so we can see what we're working with. I am going to grab my convert vertex tool and I'm going to click on my keyframes. All right. The reason why I'm doing that is otherwise it will try to create these paths for us and we don't want to try and fix them later. Might as well do them now. Okay, there we go. Zooming back out, I want my character to essentially hold where he is now. Okay, so I want him to move back and then stay in this position in order to build the anticipation. So I'm going to select this keyframe, Command or Control C to copy it, and I will paste it further down the timeline. Okay. Now, to introduce you guys to the concept of a toggle hold keyframe, currently we have our linear keyframes. All right. If I click on this middle keyframe here, right click, I have the option for toggle hold keyframe. I'll see once I select that, it changes the way that that item looks. Okay, so what a toggle hold keyframe does, it says that even though there may be a difference in information between my hold keyframe and the next one, it's only going to adjust my information, apply that change when another keyframe tells it to. All right, so I'll just undo that there. The reason why we're doing this is when we apply easing, it's going to make sure that After Effects doesn't try to interpret this information uh, incorrectly and move my ball back and forth. All right, then it is exactly the same as our ball bounce animation. I'm going to drag my ball upwards as though it has sprung off the ground. I will then land. And then we will have a little jump at the end to help transfer that momentum, sell the idea that our character hasn't broken his ankles when he lands. Okay, next step from here, I need to grab my convert vertex tool again, and I am going to click and drag on these keyframes so that I can incorporate an arc to that jump. All right, so my ball's pulling back and then he's flying in the air, landing, bouncing, landing again. Okay, I'm gonna move down my timeline and hit N for NATO, just to end my timeline. And I'm gonna right click on this gray bar over here and say trim comp to work area. This is going to remove all that excess time and now I have more space on my timeline to work with. Okay, so focusing on the idea of animating one property at a time, we can now add easing 
to our jump. Okay, so I can select all my keyframes by either clicking and dragging to select all of them. I can click on the word position and holding down shift, I can then drag over my toggle hold to deselect it and I can reselect it as well. So shift is our modifier that allows us to add keyframes to our selection or to remove them. All right, I'm then going to hit F9 on my keyboard. Alternatively, right click, keyframe assist, easy ease. Okay, now we want to sell the idea that our character is leading up to this anticipation over here. All right, so diving into our graph editor, let's take a look at what's changed. I'm gonna make sure that I'm using my selection tool now. So let's deselect the convert vertex tool. All right, so the first thing you'll notice is that our keyframe here is floating in midair. All right, that refers to the toggle hold frame. So I'm just going to quickly select that one and drag it back down to the floor. And this will allow us to work with the curve nice and simply. All right. So I want to sell the idea that our character is starting off quickly, right? So he's pumping across and then easing into that final position. So grabbing my little handle over here, right? I've got this little keyframe selected and I'm going to drag this all the way to the left. Okay. I'm going to leave this handle as is. This little arc here provides us with just enough time for our character to look as though he's um, overcoming momentum and speeding into that point. And now we have that nice aesthetic movement going on there. All right. We then have our toggle hold where nothing's going to take place. And then moving on to our third and fourth keyframe here. All right. So we remember with our ball bounce, we always want our ball to leave the ground at the jump as well as the bounce as quickly as possible. It's going to be its slowest up here at the top of its arcs. And in order to do that, we are going to adjust these handles to create some very fine, harsh peaks. All right. So if I play that back, you'll see it soars off the ground very quickly and it then hits the ground very quickly. All right. Because that's happening over here as well, I can quickly grab these handles and do the exact same thing. All right, so if I zoom in here, just to show you what I've just done. All right, uh, let's move a little down the timeline so we can see that. Okay, so I'm going to push these handles as far to the left and then as far to the right as possible. All right, now if your graph editor doesn't look like mine, if it's not automatically scaling like this, you can turn on and off this little auto zoom. All right, so that's what does that for us. And when my ball hits the ground, I don't necessarily want it to slam down. So I won't make this peak as harsh. We'll kind of let it just come to rest there. Okay, so playing that back, our motion's starting to, to look pretty slick, right? Biggest issues at the moment now is that our ball is coming to a halt in midair. Okay, and that is because at our keyframes here where our ball is in midair, you'll see that it is resting on this little horizon line where it is currently moving at zero pixels a second. I'm gonna zoom in there and I'm going to raise this off of that horizon line slightly. Okay, it's important not to raise it too high. If I do, you'll see that it affects my curve. All right, so I wanna make sure that I do lift it high enough that my ball isn't stopping in midair but not high enough that it breaks the curve that I am creating. All right, and it helps to have both of those keyframes sitting on top of each other. So I'll do the same when my ball is in the air for the second time, ever so slightly, pulling that off the horizon line, like so. All right, so now if I play that back, we slide backwards, shoot into the air, and jump over there. All right, so the reason why it's looking so slow here is because we're not moving as far and we have an entire two seconds for this ball to hit the ground. So we'll be adjusting the space or the position of those keyframes in a moment. All right, cool. So at the moment you can see that the space between all my keyframes is equidistant. All right, these first two we can leave as they are, right? That uh, the timing there, the speed feels quite right when After Effects actually decides to work. 12 seconds later. Okay. Cool. Boom, sliding to the side, that's great. Shooting into the air, I'm quite happy with how fast it's moving here. And what I can do is select these two keyframes and just drag them down my timeline 
so that they are occurring faster. So let's see what that looks like. Boom, into the air, lands, bounces, and it's a bit too sharp here at the end, so I'll just increase the space a little bit more, providing us with a couple of more frames to ease into those positions. All right, again, this one here is hovering in the air a little bit more than I would like it to. So I will readjust these. And that looks a little bit better. All right, so now we've got the initial movement. Okay, the important thing to remember with the ball and tail animation is that the goal is to provide motion for our tail to react to. All right, so even though that's the goal, our body is the driving force. We need to make sure that we get that right first before we start animating the tail. Next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down shift and hit S, scuba, to bring up my scale values. We need to remember to unlink this option here by clicking on that little link icon. This allows me to adjust my scale values independent of each other. All right, so I'm going to create my first scale keyframe. And I'm going to use my position keyframes as guides for how my scale is going to be looking at any given time. All right, so moving over and sitting on top of our toggle hold keyframe here, I want my ball to be tall. So I'll just type in the value there of 80, 120. All right, we remember that in order to maintain our volume, we always want to whatever sort of value we remove from one value, we add to the other and vice versa. All right, so I've taken 20 away from my width, I've added it to my height. Now my ball has retained its volume. It's not getting any bigger or smaller as it moves. All right, so our ball is going to then squash. All right, so I can simply then just swap these values around. So I can type in here 120 and 80, and it will then from that stretch squash down, and our ball will then shoot into midair. All right, so I'm going to go and add the values for a perfect circle and the squash where it hits the ground, and then I'll go back and add the stretch. So first off, when my ball's in midair, we want it to be a perfect circle again. All right, it then hits the ground again, Okay, so if I take a look at where my ball first squashes, 120, 80, I can click this keyframe and copy it, Command or Control C, and let's move on to where it hits the ground again, Command or Control V to paste it. Okay, now our character is not necessarily as squishy as the ball was, so we can adjust these values slightly. Let's make that 110 and 90. All right, ball in midair, 100, 100. All right, and then we hit the ground again. Okay, so again, we can copy paste the keyframe where our ball has been squashed and we can decrease the value. So let's make that 105 and 95 for that squash. Okay, then I'm going to move slightly down my timeline and apply a stretch. So we can swap these two values here. Let's make that 95, 105. And then finally, we can come to a perfect circle, 100, 100. All right, so the reason why we add this little bop at the end is to allow our character to come to rest, sell the idea that it hasn't died in midair. Okay, so that's looking pretty solid for now. We can now apply easing. Okay, so we're not going to have a toggle hold for our scale. I can select all of them, hit F9, or again, right click, keyframe assistant, easy ease and let's dive into the graph editor. All right, so our graph editor looks slightly more scary. That's only because we are working with two different values at once. We've got our Y value and our X value, okay? So starting off, we see that our ball is moving off quite quickly and then easing into that position. So if we mimic that in our graph editor for scale, we have a nice fluid motion that sells the idea of the scale taking place at the same time as the position. Okay, boom. Cool. Now I want my ball to squash down just before he leaves the ground. Okay, which means that I'm going to push these handles to the right. 
Okay, so for those of us who have maybe forgotten, the peaks in our graph editor are where all or essentially most of our motion is taking place. So this is the fastest point and this is easing into that. All right, so here I get to solve the idea of slowly getting ready and then jumping into the air. Okay, so here's where I get to go back and I'm going to now apply some stretch keyframes. All right, so we know then that my ball is squashing down, jumping into the air and coming to a perfect circle. All right, we are leaving the ground very quickly, so that's where most of our, of our velocity is. So I'm going to hover over these keyframes here and I'll move down the timeline one, two, three, four, let's make it five, let's make it six, nice round number. All right, and I can then simply copy this initial scale keyframe and then swap the values around. So I'll make that 80, 120. All right, so now we are transitioning from the squash to the stretch to the perfect circle. All right, moving further down the line, we're moving off nice and slow. We're starting to hit our velocity as we reach the end here. So let's keep it nice and symmetrical. I'll hover over the point where I've squashed and move backwards by six frames. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, for those of you who don't necessarily want to drag your time indicator back and forth, there are some shortcuts. If you're working on a Windows or a machine that has a keyboard with the page up and page down keys that will move you back and forth, up and down your timeline. On a Mac, uh, especially the new MacBook Pros, it is holding down command and your left and right arrow keys. All right, so hitting uh, either page up or page down or command left and right arrow keys will move you by one. Holding down shift will move you up and down by 10. All right, so let's count one, two, three, four, five, six, cool. And again, I will grab this keyframe here where it is being squashed when it hits the ground. Let's copy and paste it and we can invert those values. So let's make that 90, 110. All right, so I can either keep it to the same scale all right, but because our character is starting to fall and he's not necessarily a squishy character, we can actually have slightly less of a stretch there. All right, and then for the final place here, I'm not going to add a stretch in between the two squashes. All right, our graph editor will be able to handle that for us. Okay, so diving back into the graph editor now that we have added our stretch. All right, we again want this motion or this change to occur quite quickly so that we can ease into our perfect circle. So I will grab these handles and drag them to the left, which means then that our transformation happens very quickly and we ease into the top of that arc there. All right, if we want to adjust the easing again, right, so if we wanna make sure that we get into our perfect circle a little bit sooner, I can grab these handles and shift them to the left as well. Okay, so even though in class I show you guys what seems like a very routine formula, there is no real formula when it comes to um, these kinds of motions, all right? It's completely eyeballing it. So playing with the graph editor, playing it back, making sure it's how I want it to look. Playing with the graph editor, adjusting it, ramble, ramble, ramble as I wait for my After Effects to catch up. One hour later. All righty. Cool, our ball then starts to fall. All right, we want our stretch to occur towards the end here. All right, so I can grab these handles. I'm gonna zoom in here for you guys. If you guys wanna zoom in and out of your timeline, the plus and minus keys on your keyboard will do that for you. All right, and let's have that adjustment occur a bit later down the line there. All right, so if I scrub through here, there my change is starting to take effect. Okay, so here again, my squash starts to occur and I want that to happen quite late. So I will pull those handles to the right. Boom. And then if I play this section back, we can adjust our scale so that our squash ends quite early on. All right, so I'm telling it occur faster to ease into that circle and then ease into this squash only before it hits the ground. All right, and then those last little blips at the end, I'm going to leave them as they are. 
cool. So that is now our scale process finished. Okay, next up, I'm just going to quickly relabel this layer so that I know we want to get into the habit of working neatly. So that is our body. And I'm going to lock it by clicking on this little lock icon over here. All right, which now means that I can't accidentally add any shapes to this layer and I can't break any of my keyframes. All right, so the next step now is to create our tail. Right, so we're going to go back up to where we have our convert vertex tool, click and hold and grab our pen tool. Okay, now the pen tool works the same way as it does in Photoshop and Illustrator. We can adjust our fill color, we can adjust our stroke, and we can turn these on or off by clicking on fill and stroke. Typical rule of thumb anything in After Effects that is blue is a button. All right, so with my pen tool, I am going to click to create my first point. You'll see it now makes a shape layer for us and I'm going to click and drag down or up. All right, and by clicking and dragging, I apply these Bezier handles, Bezier just simply meaning curvature handles, to my point, all right? To close a shape, I need to then click on the initial point, right? So these are our vertexes or vertices, okay? Click and close, and now I have my tail. I can adjust this as I see fit, okay? Cool. Now, I'll grab my selection tool again. Let me just click off of that tail and then reselect it. Okay, so because of the method that we'll be using for our ball and tail, we are going to be doing what we call a pre-composition. All right, so compositions, if we take a look at my timeline, it's actually called comp one. We can see in my project panel that I have that comp one as well. A composition is the box inside of which we are currently working. All right, so rather than working on the tail inside the same box as the ball, I am going to pre-compose this tail. I'm going to put it inside of its own box, and then we are going to animate that box. All right, I'll show you why we take this step after we have finished the animation. All right, so with my layer selected, I can right click and I can select pre-compose. All right, the shortcut for that is Command or Control Shift C. When we select that, we get a little box here. This allows us to relabel said box, and we don't need to worry about any of these options over here. So I'm just going to call this tail precomp, and I will hit enter. All right, so we'll notice a couple of things now have changed. All right, our tail precomp, the color of our layer has changed. The little icon next to it shows us the composition little logo thumbnail, as opposed to the shape layer one. All right, we've got our bounding box indicators around the entire edge of our workspace and our anchor point is here in the center. Cool, so let's grab our pan behind tool, shortcut is Y, and we can then position that at the point of origin of our tail. So this is where our tail is going to be connected to the body. All right, so I've decided that it's going to get poofy towards the end. Obviously, I could also animate it where it's thick, where it joins the body and has a sharp point for the tail. Let's stick with this one for now. It's important to remember when making our tail that we're not going to draw it as though it's already been misshapen or deformed. All right, it's going to mess around with our effect. So we want to draw it at a standing or a resting position. Cool. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my shape tool and I'm going to grab the rectangle tool. All right. So with that now done, I am going to click and drag to create a bounding box around my tail. All right, you'll see that it has now made a mask. So anything within this bounding box will be visible, anything outside will not, okay? So essentially think of a mask as having placed a sort of solid object over the asset and now I've cut out a hole to reveal. Cool. Then I will grab my selection tool, very important, otherwise we can end up making multiple masks on the layer, which we don't want at the moment, and I will then just deselect and reselect it. All right, so now we have this wonderful bounding box over here. Moving on to our effects and presets, we are now going to apply our bend effect. If you don't see this panel, you can always go to window and check effects and presets. All right, so I'm going to search for bend it. All right, and you'll see that we have a distortion effect called CC Bendit. Okay, so one of the easiest ways to apply an effect to a layer is simply by clicking and dragging. 
you'll see that I can't apply it to anything until I hover over this layer. That is why we locked our ellipse layer, our body layer. All right, so we can't accidentally apply it there. We'll drop it on our tail. Depending where your tail currently sits, it may have disappeared. That's perfectly fine. We're going to fix that now. All right, so as soon as I drop the effect onto our tail, you'll see in our top left here, we have our effect controls. If we don't see that, we can also again go to window and turn on effect controls. All right, and here we have got the effects and controls that we can adjust and animate for this effect. So we've got our bend option, and then we have our start and end. And this is where we set the defining parameters of our asset. So we've got these little dots over here, and I can move them around as necessary, but you don't always know which is your start and which is your end. So the easiest way to go about doing that is just clicking on this little button over here. All right, so this is our start option. You'll see that it was hovering over this piece here, so that's showing that that's our start parameter, and I'm going to click and drop it where our tail would attach to the body. All right, and I'll do the exact same, except I'll place it where the tip of my tail lies. All right, so now we've set that up. If we've done it correctly, when I hover over this value zero, zero next to bend, if I click and drag to the left and right, our tail will deform. Nice. If I push it too far, you'll see that it starts to disappear. That's fine, we're not going to be pushing the tail beyond roughly these two sort of extremes here. So that's fine for us. And I'll just reset that to zero. Okay, cool. So now it is time to set up our tail so that it's actually connected to my body. With my selection tool, I am simply going to click and drag this layer and make sure that it is attached to that body. All right, if your guides are causing your box to snap back and forth, we can always go to view and say uh, where it says show guides. We can click that off so that it disappears to hide. Otherwise, the shortcut is control or command shift. And then the, da -da -da, am I doing this wrong? Sorry, it's just command or control and then the semicolon button. All right, cool. So let's just quickly close up that and let me bring up my parent and link columns. All right, so yours should already be open. Parent and link, currently they will say none. All right, so we need to parent our tail to the body so that wherever the body goes, the tail follows. Okay, so I can grab my little pick whip tool and I can drag and drop it over the body or I can use my little drop down over here and select body. All right, and this means that wherever my tail goes or rather wherever my body goes, my tail will follow. Okay, so that's quite useful. Now, with this setting, you'll see that my tail deforms along with the body. Because I've parented it to the body itself, any changes to that body will affect my tail. For now, that's fine. We won't go into the sort of details of affecting it to only allow it to be um, parented to the position. That goes beyond the scope of what we're doing this year. Um, but for now, this is fine. Okay, so now our tail follows the body wherever it goes. Cool. Next, we are going to animate the bend of that tail. Right, so back up in my effect controls, I'm going to click on the stopwatch next to bend. Right, it has created a keyframe. We can see that by the blue stopwatch. And rather than toggling the drop down here to go through all of these drop downs to get to my bend, I'm going to hit U for uniform. All right, so we remember that our shortcuts for um, our sort of major values, T for opacity, R for rotation, A for anchor point, P position, S scale. All right, hitting U will collapse everything and only show you the properties that have a keyframe on them. Okay, great stuff. Cool. So our tail is gonna start off as is, and as we pull into this anticipatory piece, I am going to adjust my bend so that my tail moves upwards. Okay, cool. Now typically, this is kind of going to be one of the only sections where our bend keyframe sits on top of the position and scale, and that's just because of this preparatory movement taking place. We do want our motion to overlap as we go. All right, so what I can do, again, we can set this to a toggle hold. So I'll hit Command C, Command V, Control C, Control V, and just to copy paste that keyframe over here, and I can then right click and say toggle hold. Okay, then as our ball jumps into the air, 
we're going to sort of move, let's say about five frames before our ball gets to the top of its arc. And I'm gonna bend my tail moving down. All right, because it hit the, or left the ground quite quickly, we can add quite an exaggerated tail movement there. All right, so the rule of thumb for this particular exercise, when our ball is moving upwards, our tail is pointing down. All right, the movement is still being transferred. This is whiplashing behind it, it's being pulled upwards. And we can also then say that we have some sort of air friction or resistance dragging on that. All right, as our body then starts to fall, before it hits the ground, we can then bend our tail upwards. All right, and then we hit the ground over here. As our ball pops into the air, we can adjust the bend again. As it starts to fall, we can adjust it to bend upwards. And then here at the very end where we have this little blip, essentially between, in the spaces between our position and scale keyframes here, I'm just going to do sequentially smaller tail flips to show the idea that the action is continuing. It's taking some time to come to rest. And there we go. All right, so playing that back, boom. Currently our tail is moving roughly at the right pace, but we do obviously need to apply some easing to that. Okay, so again, I can click and drag to select all of my keyframes for bend, holding down shift, dragging over my toggle hold to deselect that. I am going to hit F9. Okay, let's dive into the graph editor. All right, so this looks very similar to our position, but because we are constantly moving back and forth between positive and negative values, that's why our graph resembles this. Okay, so I'm gonna drag this back down to the floor the same way that we did in um, the position. And let's see. Let's have that essentially mimic the same motion. So it's gonna flip up quickly to begin with and ease into that position. All right, nice. Moving along, our ball leaves the ground very quickly. All right, so we want that motion to occur very quickly. We'll drag it out like that, boom. Now it kind of looks as though our tail, if we drag this all the way out here, is flipping down almost as if as if it is like catapulting our body into the floor. All right. Then moving forward, our tail is going to start shifting upwards, right? But that change is only really going to take place when our body begins to fall. So if we kind of think of this peak as a continuing line, if I drag this in this direction, you'll see that that sign essentially continues. Playing that back. There we go. So it may hold a little too long and I can fix that by simply adjusting where my keyframe is on the timeline. All right. So like I said, animation is mostly an activity of eyeballing emotion. As long as we have a clear idea of the motion we're trying to create, we then have the freedom to mess around with our graph editor until we get what we're looking for. All right. So again, I want most of this action to only occur once my ball has hit the ground. So let me push it out in this direction over here. There we go. We could probably have it happen a little bit sooner. Let's do that there. Cool. And drag that out there. And you'll see a little bit of a pattern forming. All right. So if I zoom out here, we have this pattern of starting down. It then flips up, goes down, flips up, and then we can leave these last few here. Um, sometimes it's a good idea to just let Easy Ease do its thing, all right? For these very small motions, if we were going to try and apply too large a change, it would look unnatural, okay? So, uh, Lord save us from the spinning beach ball of death. Okay, cool. So any adjustments that I now need to make, if I feel that my tail is not moving at the correct pace. Oh my God. Oh my God. One eternity later. All right, cool. Boom. Jumps, hits the ground. I'm quite happy with this so far. So now what I can do is I can adjust the space between my keyframes so that it's not all happening at such a slow speed. 
Okay. So typically what I would recommend doing at this level is starting from the left, we leave these keyframes where, you, where they are. I can then select all of these, making sure to unlock my body layer, select all of these, and I can start dragging them closer to each other. All right. So this is my hold over here. I can decrease the amount of time that that takes place. And then I can start adjusting as necessary. All right. Now, as you can see, our bend doesn't necessarily sit at any particular point in relation to these. All right. So we don't want to try and shift them up as they are, um, sort of like piece by piece, because I don't know if this keyframe relates to these over here. Now, obviously, I can go back and forth and check. However, we do have a shortcut for us that allows us to adjust all of our keyframes while still keeping the percentage of the distance between them equal. All right. So if I select all my keyframes, I need to make sure that I click on the furthest keyframe in my selection. All right. So on a Windows, you would hold down Alt. On a Mac, uh, the new MacBook, you'll hold down Option. And if you click and drag, you'll see that I am now decreasing and increasing the amount of space between those keyframes. Okay. This allows us to retime our animation on keys that we've already animated. Okay. The one thing that we need to keep a lookout for when we use this method, if I zoom in here, let's take a look, right? Sometimes when we do this, our keys do not fall on an actual frame indicator. So currently this exists at a halfway point between one frame and the next, which technically doesn't exist. Okay. So when this happens, we then just need to go in and move our keys to the closest edge. All right, so kind of just taking an estimated guess. Because they are now roughly only moving by half a frame, it doesn't usually matter in which direction we change them. All right, so I would go back and forth and adjust all of these as necessary. Okay, so that's essentially it for our ball bounce animation. We have our secondary motion taking place, our tail is responding to the body, and it's coming to rest. Okay, then I can hit N for NATO to help me sort of just close off that. Otherwise, I can hover over this blue head, drag it back and forth, right click on this gray bar again, and say Trim Comp to Work Area. All right, so in the next episode, I'll be taking a look at applying audio to these, but for now, we can call this one finished. I'll see you guys next week. Ciao.